Welcome to the ministry of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. We trust that the upcoming message will inspire, encourage, and motivate you to apply what you learn as you live out your faith in Christ at home and at work each day. At the end of the message, you'll find information on how to contact Living on the Edge or obtain additional resources. Now, here's Chip. Welcome to Spiritual Warfare 301, How to Do Battle with the Enemy and Win. Remember 101, we said it's real. There is an invisible world and there is an invisible war. Then in 201, we learned that you have protection. Everything you need to be victorious, you have. You've got the belt of truth. You got the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, you have everything you need. Your feet shod with the gospel, preparation of peace. Now, I want to share a story, and I'm not saying this story or sharing the story to be dramatic. Uh, this happened the first year I was in Santa Cruz. I had a number of different experiences as a pastor earlier, but this was the most radical. Because we're, we're moving from uh, just not times where you're walking faithfully with the Lord, but I'm talking about spiritual attack, the kind that at times you don't understand and scares you to death. I'll let you rewind with me the VCR of my mind, I guess it's about 13 years now, 12 and a half. New pastor, been in this community with all this occult, and it is, uh, I'll learn later, about 2 a.m. And in my first time this happened, it happened multiple times to me and family members, but this was the first time. And I don't know whether I'm asleep or I don't know whether I'm awake. What I know is, is that I can open my eyes and I can see that my wife is in bed next to me, so I'm assuming I'm awake. But the problem is I can't move anything in my body. And there's a sense of evil in the room that is so foreboding that uh, I don't even know what's going on. And not only that is that little by little, as I'm crying out to God in my mind because I can sense something's wrong and I'm praying, Jesus, help me, help me, help me. And there is a pressure like weight on my chest that feels like about 5,000 pounds that's crushing it and something going around my neck so that my windpipe is completely closed. And it's, if you've ever had someone dunk you when you were a kid in a pool and you just can't get any air and you're right at the point where you wanna go, and, and, if, and you know, the next breath you're gonna take, either you're gonna come up and get air or you're gonna take in water, that's exactly where I'm at. And I'm crying out to God and I'm praying and I'm praying, but I can't move anything and I see Teresa over there, oh God, help, help, and I can't, and I'm gonna suffocate. And I'm thinking, how in the world can you suffocate in your own bed when there's not any water? And just at that point I go, <gasps> and I, uh, I sit up in bed and I'm literally soaking wet as though I've played full court basketball for two hours. The hair on the back of my head is straight up. There is such evil in the room as those shadows and a manifestation of evil like I've never seen in my life and I am scared to death. And I don't know what's going on. And I don't know what to do. And I'll tell you a little bit later about what I did, but I will tell you, it was hostile, offensive, demonic activity, and that scene was repeated scores of times in the next 12 years or so. What do you do when it's not like you're just being deceived? It's not just a little condemnation. It's not just that you know, you're being convicted and some things are happening that you need to deal with. What do you do when for some very specific reasons there is strong frontal satanic attack? As I was sitting up in bed, I thought to myself, you know, I, I need to pray and I think I need to pray out loud. Now I'm a pastor, okay? I went to Dallas Seminary. It's not like I don't know a few verses, okay? I'm an old ex-navigator. I, I, got, I got some weapons in here, but I am scared to death and I'm thinking, I think I need to pray out loud and notice this, the enemy again, pride in the fear. If I pray out loud, my wife might wake up. If my wife wakes up and hears her husband talking out loud in the dark to no one there, and he's all sweaty, she's gonna look, wake up and go, he's a nutcase. Now, of course, she really wouldn't think that, but that's how I felt, and I was immobilized to do spiritual warfare for a period of time. At the same time, I had a 
good friend who, he would call himself a classical nominal Christian. Intellectual belief in Jesus. He said, looking back, I may have been saved, may not. My life didn't demonstrate it. Went to church now and then, a little bit more then than now. And uh, tried to be a good guy, raising my family. Came to our church Uh, made a real commitment to Christ, and then he began a process. Uh, First week he came, someone said, hey, that guy likes to play basketball. He walks right up to the podium. He said, hey, I hear you like to hoop. I said, I do. He said, well, can I play sometime? I said, what are you doing at 2 o'clock this afternoon? Every Sunday, 2 o'clock, my driveway. You there? And he came. And in the next 10 years, we spent with one another. And I watched him, marriage, get in the Bible, priorities, begin to really grow, minister to other people, do radical things with his finances. And uh, so we're, you know, we have little talks after we play ball. And he said, Chip, I can tell you something. I said, what? He said, man, something like weird happened last night. I said, what? He said, Michelle and I were just sitting on the couch and the kids had gone to bed. And, you know, it's been a great weekend. I feel real close to her and have my arm around her. And we're just watching some old movie. And she kind of dozed off. You know how your wife does sometimes. And, you know, you, it's kind of a neat feeling. Hey, he's my pretty wife and I love her. And Humphrey Bogart or some old movie and who cares. And. And he said, then it's like a thought from nowhere went, and it was a, he said, all I can tell you, it was fear. And he said, in seconds, I believed with all my heart, she's going to die. She's going to die. She's going to die. She's going to be taken away from you. And he said, my thoughts went, and he said, it was like as though someone told me she had cancer and I had the report in my hand and I'm holding her in my arms. I'm thinking, she's going to die. It might be tonight. It might be tomorrow. She's going to die. And then my mind went quickly from there to why and what kind of God would let her die and you know what I'm not sure I could believe in a God like that he said in a matter of seconds I got to thinking God wasn't good and he said I didn't know what to do I need to he said Chip what's that he said Dave that's spiritual warfare he said well how do you handle it I said well let's talk about it and what I want to do in the rest of our time tonight is talk about it many people in this room could have either similar or different stories The manifestations could be different, but what we're going to talk about is how do you do battle with the enemy and win? This is not far out. This is not crazy. This is maybe rare, but it does happen. Now, there's four facts you need to know. There's four facts that before we talk about this, you absolutely need to know. Follow along. Fact number one, God has objectively defeated Satan and his agenda. He has delivered us from sin's penalty and power and ultimately will deliver us from sin's very presence. That's a fact. In the interim, we're involved in guerrilla warfare with demonic forces. Fact number two, as believers, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light with all the rights and privileges and position that being a child of God entails. Fact number three, the spiritual battle that we fight involves a responsibility on our part to put on the spiritual protection that God has provided for us. We can and we will resist the enemy's attempts to deceive, accuse, and cast out when we stand firm by what? First, being honest with God about ourselves and others, prerequisite to all spiritual battle. Second, responding to the truth that God shows us about his will for our lives, righteous living. And third, a clear understanding of the gospel and taking opportunity to readily share it. Fact number four. The vast or great majority of all spiritual warfare never need go beyond the regular practice of living out your position in Christ by faith. What we're talking about now is not necessarily the norm. Our practice of Paul's metaphor of the spiritual armor protects us from Satan's ongoing attempts to break our fellowship with Jesus and as a result greatly minimizes any impact of the enemy. With that in mind, however, turn the page, if you will, because there are times when we must move beyond standing firm and holding on to this position that we have, and we engage the enemy in actual combat. There's certain times that it gets frontal. It's not about holding your ground. Stuff starts to happen. Let me give you a few times when you may find yourself engaging in frontal assault by the enemy. First is when we're taking significant steps of faith for spiritual growth. My friend, when this happened to him, he had started memorizing scripture. He started to get into the Bible on a regular basis. I remember him telling me, he goes, he said, I felt like a fool. 
He said, you know, I grew up in church and when I was a kid, you give a dollar. When you're an adult, you know, you give like five bucks. If you have a like ooey gooey feeling, you give them 20. He said, man, I started tithing. He said, I'm writing checks. I'm going, are you kidding me, Dave? And he said, I started, and, and, then, and, then, and, and it's not like I just give him. It's like, this is awesome. This is great. I can't believe I get in on this. And he said, now I'm starting to share my faith. He is spiritually growing. Guess what? That's when you get attacked. Enemy wanted to come in and scare him. A second time is when we're invading enemy territory. When you're in evangelism. Maybe you're on a mission trip. Uh, maybe you're involved at something with your church where you're reaching out to other people or sharing Christ with a neighbor or a friend. Third time when this may happen is when we're exposing him for who he really is. Uh, I've taught this series a couple times, and when I think about teaching it, I'll tell you this, for the last three and a half weeks since I began to teach this, I say this reverently, all hell has been breaking loose. And that's not a cuss word, that's just a reality of demonic opposition in ways that I don't have time to tell you about. But I knew it was coming. Because when you disrobe him and you become a part of letting other people see demonic spirits for what's going on, you get some shots. Another time is when you repent and make a clean break with the world and a long-held sin pattern or an unholy relationship. I've seen this happen over and over. A couple in our church are living together and they realize, you know something, we need to get right with God. And so they move out while wow, spiritual opposition. Uh, we had a uh, ministry called Celebrate Recovery. When someone came off of heroin or cocaine or a sexual addiction, for the next three months, you knew, I mean, things were going to be terrible where they were. Because what's happening? The enemy is losing one of his own. Another time here is when God is preparing us individually or corporately for a great work for his glory. Often, one of the things that lets you know that God is up to something is when there's great spiritual attack. And, and you don't know exactly why. Tell you what. In the unseen world, they often know what things are happening more than we do. I had one professor who always used to say, you know something, when we get a lot of spiritual attack, I always took that as a really good sign. We must be worthy of something in the kingdom of darkness' attention. And he said, you know, I just kind of took that as a little, uh, little merit badge on my sleeve and said, okay, let's do spiritual warfare. Let's get after it. So there are times when these things are going to happen. Here's the question. Once you're wearing your spiritual armor, and yet you find yourself bombarded by spiritual opposition, how do you engage the enemy and win the battle? If you open your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, I want to pick it up with the flow. We've learned in verses 10 through 12, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We've learned command, put on the full armor of God. Why? There's this struggle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers against the world forces of this darkness. And then having done everything to stand, we're to stand firm. And then it says how? Verse 13, take up this full armor of God and having girded your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Notice verse 16. In addition to all or on top of that, once you've done all that, notice these next three are not defensive. They're not just holding your position. The next three talk about what happens when the missiles and the attack is occurring. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet, or literally, it's receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what I want to do in our time together is look at these next three pieces of armor because they have to do when the missiles or the enemy is engaging you. So let's look at the first one. How to engage the enemy and win? Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. Take up the shield of faith. At that time, there were two types of shields. Let's just explain the metaphor. There was a small round shield. Remember like you've seen in those movies where the gladiators would fight? And, but this is not that shield. This shield was about four feet high, about two and a half feet wide, and it was oblong. And it had little hooks on the end so that they could hook on together. And the Roman army would often be in a long row, and they'd hook together and move like this. The shield was made out of iron. It had wood, one layer, two layers of wood. Linen went over top of it, and then a leather cover. They left a little opening in the shield where uh, just a gap where there's air. 
The reason being, as the Roman armies would move forward, the enemies would take their, uh, what do they call these? Arrows, good. Put them in some pitch, light them. The big words kill me. Then they would fire them and shoot them. And what they would do is they would put up the shields and and so they would come in and because of that gap, it would extinguish the flaming missiles. So that's the metaphor. That's the picture that Paul has. Uh, So much so in one ancient Greek in Seneca, one soldier came in with 200 arrows extinguished in his shield. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a picture that when he said this to this group there, they got it. They understood what he was talking about. So what is the shield of faith? What's it mean to us? The definition of faith in, the, in this context, it's our absolute confidence in God, his promises, his power, and his program for our lives. Although it is rooted in the objective reality of the gospel and our new standing with God, justification through faith, our saving faith, This faith refers to our present faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for victory over sin and the host of demonic forces. That last quote is by Kenneth Wiest. Its purpose is what? To quench all the fiery missiles of the evil one. So the shield of faith, this is not saving faith. This is the faith in God, God's promises, that when something comes, whether it's a deception or attack or like that night where you just get scared to death, The shield of faith is, we'll talk about, it's claiming God's promises, trusting God's character, and applying God's truth, and holding it up to deflect the lies and the darts, whether they be fear, accusation, condemnation, or whatever. So what are those darts? The fiery darts or missiles are the schemes, the temptations, the lies, the deceptions, and the attacks that are aimed at us, God's people. Now, get this down. The goal of the darts are to get you to shift your focus from God onto something or someone else. See, the the ultimate goal, see, it's a shield of faith. It's to get you to be afraid, to get you to feel guilty or condemned and shift your faith and your dependency from God to something or someone else. I put a few examples here. Uh, Blasphemous thoughts can be a dart. Has anyone here, I I say this and people laugh sometimes, but the people, have you ever been praying and had a really sweet time of prayer and had a cuss word go like right through your mind? And then the the next thought is like, where did that come from? And and like for me, I'm thinking, man, I've not cussed in years. I mean, that, that was an early thing that God did. And then the next thought is, what kind of Christian are you that in this intimate time with God, you would be thinking those thoughts? And then the guilt comes and the, that's, you know what, that's, that's not... That's the enemy. That's just the enemy coming in. Uh, Another possible one is hateful thoughts. Have you ever ever just, I mean, had almost unreasonable thoughts of hatred toward another person? And you're thinking, you know, I'm a Christian. I mean, I love people in general. Or uh, doubts. I mean, I don't mean little doubts. I mean like just a window of time where I don't know if I believe the whole thing. I I mean, and you can't even say that out loud. Like, because if you did, they think, what, you? but it's just a thought that comes and it kind of scares you. Uh, Or a burning desire to sin. That ever happened to you? Yeah, everyone's going, oh yeah, me, that happened to me. You know, that's right, no. (laughs) Of course it has, yeah. You know, yeah, a situation where you really, it's like you know everything in you wants to do something and you know it's absolutely wrong and it's just like, like it's a supercharged opportunity. Those are missiles from the enemy. Or have you ever had a relationship and then, you know, known someone for years and then just this flash of you question their motives? You know, I wonder if he's telling me the truth. I wonder if he's been honest all these years in this business. Just, I mean, out of the blue, just this thought that and you think, wait a second, this, these kind of things are darts. Unexplained, overwhelming times of depression. I don't mean, you know, you're down and there's normal grief and difficult times. I don't mean that your thyroid's not working like it's supposed to. I don't mean that you haven't had a lack of sleep. I I mean certain times where it is like you're in the sunlight and then someone turns a switch and it's like, and and you're just, I mean, you're not in the pits, you're in the bottom, in the muck, and you don't want to come out. Those are darts. It's how the enemy works. I mean, those are a few examples. You could give me many, many more. So, how does it work? 
Um, how, how does Satan, when he attacks, what's he do? I'm going to suggest that you study carefully Genesis 3 and Matthew chapter 4. If you really want to understand how the darts work, Genesis 3, study carefully. Just, I mean, not a, just for yourself. Study carefully the tactics of what occur with Adam and Eve, and then go to Matthew chapter 4 and study when, where, and how Jesus would tempt, was tempted. And from those passages, you'll see a classic methodology. It often starts with disguise. You don't know where it comes from. Then doubt is cast on God and His Word or on you and your worthiness. But by the way, when these attacks come, it doesn't matter. I don't think Satan cares. If he can get you to think God is cruel and uncaring, that He's harsh, that He doesn't love you, that how could a good God do this? He's got you going. Or if He can get you, you're worthless, you're terrible. You, I mean, you call yourself a mother, you call yourself a Christian, you, call, you, you think you're a real man after the cowardice move. It doesn't matter as long as He can get you thinking inaccurately about God or yourself or others. He takes you down the trail. Disguise, casting doubt, and then he provides, in the midst of that window of opportunity, an appealing, immediate alternative rooted in the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. In the midst of that vulnerability, those lies and those darts, then he sets right out for you, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. I, I put a passage there, it's uh, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, worthy of our memorization. Because every temptation I believe that I can find in Scripture will fall into one of three categories. We're told in that passage, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, for those who love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. And then for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world and all that is in the world is passing away, but he or she who does the will of God abides forever. You need to know the missiles are going to come and there'll be an appeal to your flesh or an appeal to your eyes or an appeal to your ego. And those will be the ways that he'll come. And here's the application. Darts of doubt and deception must be immediately met by the shield of faith. And you say, well, what do you mean? Picture that for me, Chip. I don't get it. That means you do this. Your active, present application of the truth to your personal situation as soon as you recognize a dart has been received. See, often when this happens, you're not sure where it came from. But to hold up the shield of faith is, as soon as that comes, you take a specific truth of Scripture and hold up the shield of faith to deal with that issue. Let me give you three quick examples. First is my friend. What's the issue here? It's trusting in God's character. He's, he's a new Christian. He's growing. He's taking enemy territory. He's there with his wife, and he has this overwhelming feeling his wife's going to die. Anybody here had that as a parent with one of your kids? Anybody here awaken in the middle of the night with just this vivid sense that one of your children are going to die? And then you wake, or, or in a dream, and then for the life of you, the, the emotions of it are so real that you begin to operate and live out of fear? I, I've been there. Or that something terrible is going to happen? And then this feeling, well, God, how could God let that happen? You know, when my friend talked to me, he says, what do I do? I said, Dave, you've got to take the truth of God's word and you've got to nail that dart and hold up the shield. Psalm 84, 11, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord God gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Dave, God's character is good. That thought is never from him. God would never cruelly allow something to happen in that way. He's for you. He loves you. You don't have to doubt his character. The goodness of God is that he is eager to be our friend. The word goodness, actually, it's root worded in generosity. God, I love Tozer's word for this. God finds holy pleasure in the happiness of his children. That's how God feels about you. He wells up inside when good things happen in your life and in your heart. And all that was was a dart. And what you have to hold up is bang. Hey, Satan, be gone. That's not true. This is what God's like. Or in the situation here, you need to trust in God's promises. It says, he will accomplish what concerns me. I shared with you earlier that there's times, you know, actually last week, that, you know, I was sort of like in the daylight and a switch went off and I'm in the dark. And I mean, I'm, I'm really down, dooby doo, down, down, depressed, not just a little. Every Saturday afternoon or almost every Saturday afternoon that would occur to me before I preached in Santa Cruz. And for a while I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I'm the pastor. 
I've prepared all week. I was excited. I go out early for a couple hours. I review my message. I can't wait to give it. And then sometime between 11 and about 3 o'clock, I go through this time where it's like, man, I don't want to preach. I don't want to be a pastor. I'm a terrible person. I mean, just depressed. I mean, I don't want to get in my car and drive to the church for the Saturday night service. And then finally I learned what was going on here. And I had to trust the promise of God. I have been called to preach your word. God promises, what is it? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Your promises are true. What's your promise? You'll give me all the strength to do whatever you call me to do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and what do you do? You take the shield of faith as you take a specific promise and you apply it to that lie or that dart or that deception. Uh, this last year, a couple years, with walkthrough, we had times that I just thought, oh, Lord. I mean, I didn't want to go into the office and I can say this now because there's some staff members here, but there's times where I thought, oh, Lord, unless you show up, unless you provide, man, I feel like, you know, the economy and all these transitions, we're going to go down the tubes. Chip, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It's a promise. And I trusted it. And you hold it up because what happens? You start to fear. That's how you apply the shield of faith. The final way is trusting God's program and timing. His ways are not always easiest, but they're always best. Jeremiah 29, 11, a classic passage. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans for welfare, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, when you're tempted, when the dart comes, get out of this marriage. When the dart comes, don't pay that person back. When the dart comes, go ahead and sue him. He deserves it. When the dart comes, you know what? One little peek, one little look won't mean anything. And you step back and you say, no, God has a plan for marriage. It's a tough season. Everything in me wants to opt out but I've been through other tough seasons and Lord, I will keep my commitment to you. I will trust you. And you know what happens? Anybody who's been married more than 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you sit down and really talk to them, they've all had seasons that if they did what they felt like when it got tough, they would have all bailed out. But it's going through that and the struggle and the commitment. You know, love is not a feeling. Love is giving another person what they need the most when they deserve it the least. It's how God loved me. And I'm to walk in love just as Christ also loved me. And so I trust God's timing. I trust His program. He says, this is marriage. This is the way it works. Stay with it. Here's my, here's my view of relationships and business. Stay with it. Don't go outside those boundaries. You claim the promise and you apply it to the specific missile that comes at you. Do you get that? Did I give you enough examples so you, you, you realize the issue the struggle where the missiles are coming in your life. It's not just a general, oh God, help me. It's taking the truth of God's word and applying it to that situation. Second, then he goes on and says, take up the helmet of salvation, or literally, it's receive the helmet of salvation. Now, this is a command that for you to take upon this helmet. It's the Roman soldier, he would have this get up on, and then he would be usually holding his sword over here, and it would put on things, and they usually have, uh, I forget what they call them, but the little guys that would come and help and hand him the helmet. And it was the last piece of armor that he would put on. And it was made of bronze and leather. And it was the most, obviously, the most important gear, because if you get hit on the head, you're out. And so this was the most important gear that he's going to put on before, and it's the last thing before he goes to battle. The definition here, it's obvious allusion to the security that we have that we're saved as justified believers and safe from Satan's attacks. But the focus in this passage is on the present deliverance from sin. The word salvation just doesn't mean you're saved from sin forever. The word salvation literally means to be delivered. Now, the, the moment you come to Christ, you're delivered out of sin. But as you see the word like in the Psalms, over and over and over, you'll hear people, uh, David talk and the psalmist talk, oh God, deliver me. He's not talking, he's talking about deliver me from my enemies. And you have to put on the helmet of salvation and the confidence that we're delivered. The helmet of salvation is the certainty of deliverance from sin and the protection, are you ready, of our minds in the battle. The helmet protects your mind. 
One commentator says, it is the ability to think logically, to reason wisely, and to maintain a biblical world view in the midst of attacks on your mind and your thinking. It's not simply that you can, something you can do. You receive it, but it's must something you must allow God to do. And so you need to ask, well, how do you do that? You do that by renewing your mind. Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Literally, it's in that same passive voice. But allow yourself to be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that your life might demonstrate what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The helmet of salvation has, we must get God's word in our mind in such a way so it protects us, the truth that protects us. Uh, John 17, 17, you might jot in the corner. When Jesus was wanting to prepare the disciples, and it's this his last prayer before the Father. Do you remember what he prays? Sanctify them by your truth. And then the next line is, your word is truth. Romans 8, great picture. 8, 5 through 8. The mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind set on the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible to do so. But the mind set on the spirit brings life and peace. You need to understand the battleground is for your mind. We need to take on this helmet of salvation. And here, here's what we have with the helmet of salvation. You know, regardless of what you go through, you have a hope that will never fade. You know that with the helmet of salvation, you may go through all kind of doubts and struggles, but you have been justified. Your eternity is secure. And so now what you say is, in the midst of these bombarding thoughts and missiles, I don't need to be afraid because I am God's child and my destiny is secure. In fact, so much so, the Apostle Paul will use the same phrase in 1 Thess 5, 8, and Paul calls the helmet our hope of God's certain deliverance. The, the hope or the helmet of salvation is the certainty that all God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Every promise of God, any struggle that comes your way, all the promises of God, independency, those who are in Christ, the answer is they're yes for your life. He always comes through. I can share this now because uh, it's a year or so old, but uh, the very first year at walkthrough was probably as difficult a time that I've ever had my personal life, and it's the most difficult time I've ever seen my wife go through. And there were a lot of circumstances in the death of her mother and uh, multiple circumstances after that, but when we got to Atlanta, I've never seen her so discouraged, I've never seen her so dejected, I've never seen her go through so much. At the same time, that's at home, you know, you wake up, guys, remember, this has happened a few times, you wake up in the middle of the night and there's someone sobbing and kind of with their head in the pillow, you know that one? Or when just before you're ready to say goodbye, a couple times you go and you know they're in the bathroom drying their hair or whatever, or that's what you think, and you hear someone sobbing through the door. And, and you know, you, you can't fix it. I mean, you just can't fix it as a man. And then I would go to work and I realized, you know, at the church I learned to trust God for hundreds of thousands and like a few million dollars, or at least a you know, big capital campaign, me three or four, five, six million dollars, and you need to trust the Lord and God builds the buildings. And well, I went to walk through and like it's like, hey, grow up, chip. You know, we're in 82 countries and, you know, it's millions and millions of dollars. So when you start dropping 38% of your income, it's like, and so, you know, candidly, I'm scared to death. And I remember, you know, I cried out to God and then I just cried. I remember going down to my desk and putting on a little worship tape and, you know, that guy who was talking about the dry season, I, I, wasn't a, I was in a drought, man. I was just like, God, I, I don't know if my wife's going to make it through this. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. You know, I, you promised me, you told me this is what you wanted me to do. Either I didn't hear your voice or I'm just like the dumbest guy in the whole world. And I'm thinking maybe this organization's not going to make it. Maybe my wife's not going to make it. And maybe this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I mean, I love that church and why in the world did I ever do this? And yet I made a decision. I would never go there in my thinking. But the darts kept coming. And so I remember the helmet of salvation. And I remember literally, and I, I mean, I don't mean this dramatically, but I, guys, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big crier. You know, I don't just, you know. But I mean, I was bawling. And I was bawling because I thought, God, I can't fix this. I mean, I don't know any billionaires that are just saying, hey, Chip, how many million you need? Give me a call, baby. I'll take care of that. You know? 
And, and, and I can't get inside my wife and, and, you know, she went through loss, 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 hurt, hurt, hurt. I, I knew that. This is going to be a journey. I can't fix that. I remember being downstairs and literally crying and just saying, oh, God. And, um, and the good news is God delivered those things. But you know, this thought came to me, and it's the helmet of salvation. It's a great picture. I wanted to share it. Here's the thought that came to me. Okay, Chip, what if your wife doesn't make it? What if, uh, what if walk through the Bible goes right down the tube? And since now living on the edge is hooked, it goes down the tube too. What if everything, quote, you ever work for just goes into ashes? Um, do you remember that if you die tomorrow, that you'll be with me forever and ever and ever and ever? And what if, if in your heart of hearts, at least in the integrity of your heart, you may have been deluded, but at least, Lord, you know my motives. I did what I thought you wanted me to do. I left security to follow you. I got out of my comfort zone to do what I thought you... If this thing goes down the tube, the worst thing that can happen is I took a step of faith in the integrity of my heart and the whole thing fizzles and, and someday I'll be with you and you'll know there was one son in California who said, I wanted to believe you to the point of stepping out at radical risk and I know you honor and love faith. And you know something? You can use some other organization to reach the world. You can develop some other ministry. And I know someday, somehow, you work something out with my wife. But you know what the, you know what the ultimate hope was? You know, the worst thing can happen to you is you can die. Now think of that. I don't care. I mean, you're, you're going bankrupt. Yeah, I know. One of your kids has cancer. Yeah, I know. Your business partner and finances are in the ditch. Yeah, I know. The worst thing that can happen to you, I mean, worst thing that could ever happen is you or someone you love who's a believer dies. And the moment they die, they're with Jesus. That's not all that bad, is it? I mean, is that like just the worst thing that can happen? Oh gosh, I'm going to go be with Jesus in a perfect environment forever and ever and ever and ever. And all my desires and longings be... That's the helmet of salvation. And you know, when you get to the point, the Apostle Paul basically said, I've already given myself the sentence of death. You know what, what he was really saying? I got the helmet of salvation. See, see, when you're already dead, it's hard to hurt someone. Hey, if you do that, I'm going to do this against you. I'm already dead, man. If you do that, then we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do that. And you could die. Yeah, well, you know what? Shoot me, babe. You shoot me, and guess what's going to happen? I'm going to be with Jesus. You are secure. You have a hope. And your hope isn't in finances. Your hope isn't in people. Your hope isn't in circumstances. Your hope isn't other people coming through for you. Your hope is not what's going to happen someday, some way, somehow. Your hope is in the person of Christ. Whom do you have in heaven but Him? And besides Him, you desire nothing else on earth. Amen. You know, that's true. And see, when the darts come, whew, put up the shield. Then... Helmet of salvation. And then next he's going to say, hey, that's not all. Then pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this isn't the big, long, heavy sword. This is the two-foot sword that you see in those movies that the Roman soldiers use because this is for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. The de definition of this sword, most times in Scripture, the sword of the Spirit is logos, or, or the sword of the Word of God is logos. But here, with the sword of the Spirit, it's rhema. It's the spoken word or words given to us by the Spirit to do close hand-to-hand -hand combat with the lies and deceptions of the enemy. The truth of God's word quoted and applied to the specific lie or deception that the enemy will allow you, that comes to you, so that you can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's the sword of the Spirit. Jesus modeled this. I mean, a lot of commentators, you need to read all kind of stuff about what this means, I'm thinking... Either I'm not that smart or people try and make things complicated. If you want to know what the sword of the Spirit is, open Matthew chapter 4 and watch Jesus do battle with the enemy. And the enemy comes and says, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. It is written. Man won't live by bread alone, but by every word, are you ready? Rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you're the Son of God, you know, each time what happens? Temptation, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, 
answer, it is written, it is written, it is written, and he speaks out loud the truth of God into the lie of the enemy, and, and when he's done, Satan departs. That's what it means to resist the devil. You resist the devil by putting on the full armor of God, and it's taking the sword of the Spirit and coming against the lies with the specific truths that apply to the situation. Psalm 119, 105. God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. Are some of you starting to get the idea that the idea behind Scripture and renewing your mind and meditating and studying is not about getting a little daily devotional, reading your chapter and a half, putting a little check in the box and saying, oh goody, I don't feel guilty now. <laughs> Moses said to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 32, take to your heart every word with which I am commanding to you today. For this word is your life. This word is your life. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. Thy word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. One of the things, if you're going to have the full armor of God, you have to be a man or woman of this book. Not legalistically, not like have to, got to, but you have to begin to master this book. You need to read it in such a way where you can think your way through certain chapters where you memorize core passages so that your mind is renewed so you know who you are and then you can reach in. Jesus reached into five smooth stones, right? Out of Deuteronomy. And he quotes and defeats the enemy. That's how you take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Practical considerations is to note that the sword is both an offensive and a defensive weapon. I love this passage in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and marrow, both joint, joint and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The way that you keep the belt of truth on is to be in the word with an humble, open heart to God so that as you read it, he can reveal where your heart is so that he can restore you. Now, let's go back to my bedroom, and I'm going to invite you in for a brief follow-up visit because a lot of information, but Chip, uh, okay, so what'd you do? I mean, what, what did you do? You, you sat up, okay, you, you're, you're walking with the Lord, you sat up, you're scared to death, you don't want to say something, but what did you do? I uh, got a hold of myself and wiped off a little sweat and realized that this was demonic. It wasn't very hard to figure that out, to tell you the truth. So with my heart going like this. And then I realized my position in Christ. And I realized greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And then out loud I spoke into the night and I said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And then I quoted 1 John 5, 4 and 5. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then I quoted Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life, even unto death. And then I did something that I hadn't had a lot of experience in, but I said, Evil and demonic spirits, I come against you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I am a child of God. I'm covered by his blood. And I command you right now, leave my house and leave me alone in Jesus' name. And it was like, gone. Now, I will tell you, there were times in multiple other experiences where uh, it took two, three, four, five times and some extended prayer before that happened. But normally it was boom. I engage the enemy. And, and I put on the bottom here, notice carefully. How do you engage the enemy? Prerequisite, healthy spiritual life. Understand your position in Christ, first three chapters of Ephesians. Discern when demonic influence may be the cause. Claim God's promises out loud. And then take your authority and position in Christ and command the demonic forces to cease their activity and depart. Okay? It's very clear. Now, I want to say something because here's how a lot of people take this. 
Oh yeah, that's in a weird place like Santa Cruz. I've heard about that in mission fields and I've had a couple examples like that, but you don't expect a regular, I mean, you have to go to seminary to do this, right? No. By the way, this is normal Christianity all over the world. And some of you gave me head nods to tell me the experience, I've rarely shared the experience about choking in a group where someone hasn't come and said, really? That's happened to me? I thought I was the only one. I thought I was going crazy. I thought I was having panic attacks or something at night. It's a very common, when I read the literature, a very common way for demonic forces to seek to scare God's people. Now I want to give you a word picture. So instead of you going, okay, I now know if something ever happened like that or if it does happen now, how Chip would do it and I feel totally inadequate and there's no way I'm going to pull that off, okay? Because that's how you're thinking. I want to t now let me, to let me give you one word picture to nail this down so when you walk out that door, if anything happens to you like that, you will have this with a grasp that you can use at any time you need to. Okay? Here's the word picture. It was a, a series of a couple of events, but in downtown Santa Cruz, there's a, uh, this thing's getting a little uh, wobbly on my ear here. Let me, let me see if I can loosen this up here. Okay, at any rate, I wanted to, oh, that's, that's a little high. How's that, Jared? That works? Good. Anyway, let me give you a word picture then, okay? Let me, let me back up to where I was at. Let me give you a word picture then that will help you the moment you have the situation, that rather than feeling like it's <gasps> scary, you'll walk out and you will clearly be able to do exactly what I've said. In Santa Cruz, there's a strip called Pacific Avenue, and there's a number of bars and I remember walking down Pacific Avenue and uh, it was getting a little rowdy and there was two or three very burly guys in kind of tight t-shirts that looked like they could kill you and were very tall, very large. And if they weren't on steroids, then they were pumping a lot of iron and doing all kind of other stuff. And they looked like, boy, I would not mess with these guys. And there was a bouncer there who was trying to get things under control and they were drunk and they were getting pretty really out of control. And so they called the police. And so I just happened to be walking by and these things were happening and a police car pulls up and I'm thinking, you know, I'm human. I like to watch this and see what happens, you know, <laughs> you know, so I kind of get over here like this and, you know, see how this is going to play out. And I, no, so help me, door opens and, and ladies, I don't mean this in any like sexist way at all, but you know, this guy's trying to handle these big burly guys. The door closes and about a four foot 11 police officer who's a female steps out. And I'm thinking to myself, if I was the guy trying to get these big, burly, drunk guys under control, I was like hoping for like a 6'5 weightlifting police officer, not a 4'11 woman. And so I thought, I'm just going gonna to kind of watch how this whole thing plays out. And, and I could have not been more wrong. Because, you know, the issue is not your size or your strength. The issue is your authority and your power. Watch this carefully. I, I watched this happen. This uh, very confident four foot 11 officer walks out. <laughs> Gentlemen, do we have a problem here? Hey, man, we're good here. Get out of here. Excuse me. And she had this badge on right here. I'm authorized by uh, Santa Cruz County to enforce the law. I'd like both of you to know that understand right now over against the car. Do you understand? And they both started to balk a little bit and she put her hand on her revolver. It was a 45. And, and you know what? I've never seen two big, strong, drunk guys get sober so fast. And it was like, I think she might use it, you know? And pretty soon, I get this four foot 11 little gal and two guys, you know, like this. And she's going, boom, 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 spread them out. But I don't hear. You know why? She has a badge that has a position of authority that says, I have all right and authority vested in me to exercise that. You must do what I say. And if there's any problem with that, I have some power on my leg that can enforce it immediately. You are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your badge is your position in Christ. And you have on your side, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
And demons must believe and obey and respond to the authority of every child of God who takes the word of God and shoots the bullets of God to the specific issues. And you don't have to be strong or spiritual or go to seminary or know a whole lot. What you have to do is claim who you are and act on what is true and they must obey. As we wrap up this message, there may be some next steps you need to take, and we'd like to help you on that journey. If today's topic raised some additional questions or issues that you'd like to explore more in depth, take a look at Chip Series Diabolical, Satan's Agenda for Planet Earth, including you. In addition, be sure to take some time to visit our website where you'll find a number of free resources, information on all our audio and video series, as well as timely updates and information from Chip. The web address is simply livingontheedge.org. That's livingontheedge.org.